Assalamu alaikum. I'm Aisha. And I'm Amanda, and this is Converts Unplugged. So, Assalamu alaikum, Aisha. Alaikum salam. How are you? I'm okay. Hey, Amanda. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, this is our first program that we are recording of our new podcast. Um, mm. So, Aisha, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, just for the listeners? So, um, I, yeah, so I'm Aisha. I have been Muslim for 15 years. I currently live in Cardiff. I'm a chaplain. Well, I will be a chaplain soon, inshallah. I'm trying to keep it really brief. Okay, so that's um, interesting. Brief, I don't really know what to say. That's okay. So you said you're going to be a chaplain. What exactly does that mean? So a chaplain is a person, well, usually of a faith, but actually nowadays no faith as well, who offers spiritual and pastoral care. Um, most often remembered for doing that, sorry, offering care to, uh, for NHS patients, but there are also, there are also chaplains within prisons. Um, there's mm-hmm. a large chaplain group within uh, Canary Wharf, for example, and also in the army, the RAF, and even on oil rigs, would you please? So, um, amazing. So you've just recently completed studies to become a chaplain, is it? Yeah, inshallah, hopefully I'll, I, I would have passed, I hope, by now. Okay. And, um, yeah. So, that's really interesting so so and you've been Muslim for 15 years that's quite hmm. that's quite a time um so I guess we couldn't really call you a new Muslim could we yeah I think we can we can have a discussion about that though can't we um no I, I don't yeah I, I don't refer to myself as a new Muslim at all um but yeah it, it feels like forever it really really does and I think 15 years to some and if you look back it's like well it's only a decade and a half actually it it really does feel like a lifetime I mean I've got kids now you know I have children who are in secondary school um you know I've learned a lot along the way um in terms of life experiences as well as just Islamic kind of um, knowledge I mean I mean both um you know I've grown as a person Mm -hmm. um not just in age (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah it's it's definitely um it's been a heck of a journey I have to say okay that sounds really interesting hopefully in future episodes we can talk about that a little bit more um about you know the I'm I'm thinking especially of the the chaplaincy part um Mm. because that sounds really interesting but tell me a little bit more about your journey so you've been Muslim for 15 years so you must have been mashallah quite young when you actually converted yeah so uh, I took shahada when I was 20 Mm. um so there you go I'm giving away my age there you go uh <laughs> yeah so I took shahada when I was 20 made my mind up about it though at 16 16 wow um, but I was slightly distracted for four years okay um, <laughs> well teenage years uh, isn't it yeah I mean but the thing is I wasn't the rebel that most people associate teenagers being especially from a white British background okay um, I definitely was not in fact, I've never been to a club. I've never smoked, never been drunk. I, I was actually, alhamdulillah, very much shielded from all of that. But like I said, four years of a bit of a distraction. But that mm-hmm. distraction kept me away from all of those things. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, I can go into detail if you want me to, but I, I don't so, know. No, well, we can just say that there was, <laughs> there was good in that distraction, even if it there distracted was a lot. you from Islam. So. Well, the thing is, it actually led me to Islam okay. because... Okay. It, yeah, it, it did. Um, the distraction led me to Islam and confirmed my decision. Alhamdulillah. Um, and then it was only after I took shahada that that distraction was no longer, I suppose you could say, needed within my life. Okay. Um, yeah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's interesting. It's interesting, though, because I look back and I realise I, I used to think quite deeply as a child, as a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had a very interesting philosophical discussion at the age of 14 with some friends in school um you know and I concluded myself that even if there wasn't a god because we would discuss god because when I went to school you see you have to understand where I went to school I was an ethnic minority so um you know uh, most of my- so you yeah. so you lived you lived in a in a in an area with a lot of what we would call uh, ethnic minority communities but well, you actually, were actually no. a minority there well, well, actually, no, I didn't, because where I lived mm. um, and then where I went to school were actually very different, very, very different. I oh, mean, okay. you know, I grew up, I, yeah, so basically, um, I grew up in London. I'm not actually English, but I grew up in London since I was six. And London has been described as like, a, it's a massive city, as people know, and it's 
heavily and densely populated but it's, it's the case of you can turn a corner and you're in a completely different world yes um, and you'll you'll have a completely different demographic yeah. where I grew up was a bit ghetto um and a bit it was very white working class and it was just not the nicest of places like I would keep myself to myself but where I went to school like I said it was very South Asian okay. um and I, and I ended up going to school there and I like I said I made a decision about Islam at 16 had a discussion about religion and, and life and the meaning of life at 14 so yeah it was a very interesting time for Humble. That sounds really interesting actually um definitely wish we had time to go into more detail on that maybe we will in a future show um so 20 years old you've converted to islam has it been an easy journey since then no absolutely not <laughs> sorry i don't mean to laugh um sakhrala it's it's not something funny but it's just i laugh because i've interviewed and talked to a lot of people who've converted and none of them have had an easy journey no, it, I mean, it, it's fine, by the way. I mean, like you, everyone I, I think I've known who's converted has not had a good time at all. Um, you know, the thing is, like, uh, you know, uh, you have to remember there's a verse in the Quran that says, you know, do you think that you say you will believe and not be tested? Yeah. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, you know, when you are going through those tests or when I, the previous test that I'm referring to, mm. um, it's blooming difficult. You know, it's not easy at all. And you know, it's it's very much a reality when converts do go on a lot of the time, especially on social media, about their troubles and about what they go through. They're real. They're not made up. They're not fake. No one's going to make anything like that up, you know. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, for example, 2006, because I took my shahada 2005, 2006 mm -hmm. till maybe eight years later. Let me try and do the math there. Um, <laughs> 2012, whatever it was. I, I didn't speak to my dad or see him for eight years because he kicked me out of his house and didn't want anything to do with me. So yeah, that was for eight years. And then eventually, alhamdulillah, now he's come round and he probably doesn't get it. And I know he doesn't have much knowledge, but he's completely fine. And, you know, now alhamdulillah. he's alhamdulillah, you know. Um, so that was hard for eight years. And then there was obviously the abusive marriages. And mm -hmm. I think that's become almost a cliche now, hasn't it really? It, it, it has, but yeah. I think it's important to raise awareness of it because I think a lot of people are naive about these things and they mean well, um, you know, they want to help somebody who's new to the religion to get married, to fulfill half of their religion, but they don't think about the implications of that and mm. the implications of somebody who isn't themselves a convert taking on the responsibility for someone who is, mm -hmm. because it is a responsibility, you know, how, how you treat that person can impact on their actual iman mm. and if you mm. don't know how to do it and if you don't have the empathy and the appreciation for the difficulties of changing your religion you know it could have a negative impact so Absolutely. i think it's important to raise awareness about it um yeah. and i'm i'm glad that we're going to bring that up um so yeah so what do you want to achieve what is your idea for getting involved in this podcast or your motivation for getting involved in the converts unplugged podcast I think I think that's what you just mentioned is are the reasons or is the reason why education 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 so Tony Blair apparently said right <laughs> so um <laughs> more people to mention <laughs> well, she, yeah it's, oh, that was really poor but it, you know I'm it's winging it here okay yeah. it's a quote. um <laughs> you know subhanallah no seriously though because I've been probably having a few rants here and there, as I do on my social media. And I think, you know, it got to the point where I was like, you know what, enough is enough. And we, alhamdulillah, we met each other, which is great. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, and then alhamdulillah, you know, now's the time. Now was obviously Allah's decided this is the right time for, for a couple of heads to get together and to actually do this. And I'm glad to be a part of that, inshallah. So let's see how it goes. Good. Yeah. Good. Yes. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. Fab. Okay. Um, so I guess it's my go. <laughs> yes. I was just about to ask you, Amanda. Yes. Do introduce yourself. Um, I can. Okay. So my name is Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, I am currently domiciled in Wales, as I think the technical term is. Um, but as my accent probably gives away, I am not actually from Wales either. Although, Interestingly, I think I'm probably, quote, ethnically Welsh, end quote. Um, my grandfather, well, my, my, my surname is a very Welsh surname. Um, 
I, my grandfather was from the borders originally. Oh. He, he was born and raised in Ludlow, but his parents, I think, came from within Wales. Um, my dad was born in London. So um, my heritage is Welsh slash Irish slash Northern English on my mum's side um, mm -hmm. with a smattering of German and goodness knows what else, because I was born and raised in Canada where we are very, very mixed. Um, mm. So, yeah, so I grew up in Canada, but I moved to the UK in 1998. I had already been convinced of Islam and was practicing Islam at that time. Um, I didn't move from Canada to the UK. I, I sort of went around in the other direction. I went to Japan for five years to live and work. And yeah, then tell us more about that eventually. Yeah. Uh, eventually, inshallah, it's a yeah. long story. <laughs> so I went to Japan to live and work. Um, and then when I finished in Japan, came around the other side of the planet to London <laughs> and um, settled here. I originally came here just to do postgraduate studies. And then I had officially converted then in London. I ended up getting married. So that sort of got me stuck here, as it were. I was already a British citizen. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about immigrating and all of that. It was quite easy in that respect. But yeah, I, I got married, had two children, and as the cliche goes, was trapped in a very toxic marriage for 16 mm -hmm. years until I managed to get out. So I can't really love for that. And, you know, it was a, it was a difficult experience, but it made me what I am today which mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. I, I look at myself now subhanallah and I think okay well I'm quite resilient uh I, I am opinionated <laughs> that's for yeah, sure yeah. I think anybody who knows me will attest to but one thing that it taught me is that there are so many people who convert to Islam who the community just doesn't know how to treat us and yeah. how to support us and, you know, this show is not just about marriages, obviously, but it is an important mm -hmm. part of it. Um, but, you know, when I, when I came out of my former marriage, I immediately got involved in a local halakha in the mosque, which was for new Muslim sisters. And I got involved in that because I thought I need to start from zero. I need to start from scratch. I need to unlearn a lot of stuff and relearn a lot of stuff. But then while I was there, I realized that I had these years of experiences that could actually help these sisters. So I got myself some training in mentoring and I spoke to the other sisters who were running the halakha and we decided that, yeah, we need to put together more of a support system. So not just teaching the religion, but also, you know, one-to-one -one mentoring, mm -hmm. counseling if need be, but of course we would signpost to that. Um, and any other social support that these sisters needed. And then we found a couple of uh, brothers who were like-minded, who set up a similar program for the brothers in the mosque. Mm -hmm. So we've been running that for about the last five years okay. until the pandemic locked us down. So now we've taken yeah. it virtual, yeah. alhamdulillah. So this is mm -hmm. what I thought, you know, with the, with the podcast, mm -hmm. it actually started out last Ramadan. I did a radio Ramadan program with a couple of mm -hmm. my colleagues and the feedback was such, everybody kept saying, you know, can you make this regular even after Ramadan? Yeah. So for those of you who asked, here it is. It is now, yeah, we've, we've, we've sort of changed it now. It's a monthly podcast, but yeah. talking about the same kind of thing. So for me, the aim behind this is first and foremost to let new Muslims or any converts, even if they're not new, know that, you know, you're not alone. Whatever you're going yeah. through, there are loads mm -hmm. of us who have gone through similar and yeah. we're here to support you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. But then also number two, for the wider Muslim community, just to raise awareness, these are the kind of things that new Muslims go through. And if you have people who have converted to Islam in your life, these are the kind of things that you should be watching out for. These are the types of things that you should be asking them about. These are the types mm -hmm. of things that you should be aware of so that you can offer them support rather than, I hate to say it, but becoming part of the problem. Yeah, because if you don't mind me saying, I mean, I think I don't know about you, but I think with my own experiences, a lot of the time people have become a craft, they were part of the problem because not out of ignorance in terms of they didn't know, it was almost like they didn't want to care. They didn't want to help or be supportive. In fact, they they were more often than not actually very much the opposite of supportive, um, mm. deliberately opposite of supportive. Um, 
which I find absolutely terrible. And, and I think the thing is, what people don't, what people need to keep in mind as well, the wider community, is that yes, we're going to be tested. Mm-hmm. We're absolutely going to be tested. And just like you, I truly believe I've be- I've come out the other side still a bit wounded, still a bit healing, and far more resilient than I ever did. You know, I've just moved from London back to South Wales, mm-hmm. which I never thought I could do. And for UK terms, that's a big move. Might not be for the US or Canada, but for UK terms, that's a big move, right? <laughs> In Canada, <laughs> that's like driving down the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I knew that's like quite funny, really. But, um, but you know. But again, it is I'm, a big move. Uh, it's a big move. You know, when you uproot, and it's not a city where I was born either. I wasn't born here. I was. Born it's a whole other country. It is. Well, yeah. And I'm actually quite glad about that. Yeah, going back to my original point is the fact that converts can be rocked severely by certain experiences. Yeah. And while some people may be very quick to judge erroneously that, well, it's your mind, your mind is low. Well, yeah. What do you expect if you've been treated like something under your shoe for however many, you know, years or whatever? Of course, your mind's going to be rocked. And of course, they're going to be thinking, well, this is all Muslims. You know, and I've been there and I've done that. And alhamdulillah, I'm still here. Mm-hmm. You know? So this is why as well, it's really, really important to realise that, okay, you know, I'm not suggesting we be handled with kid gloves, but, you know, we come with our own baggage. We we do actually come with our own cultures. And I'm not just talking just white British, and you're obviously not talking white Canadian. We're talking about converts. We've actually come across the spectrum of races, backgrounds and cultures here. Yeah. Uh, You know, we come with our own customs and way, ways of doing things and Absolutely. expectations. And we don't always want to, or we shouldn't necessarily necessarily rather have to conform to the other to be accepted because we are our own people and, and persons within our own right. So this is such an important point. I'm really glad that you've brought this up because I know that a lot of people, when we convert in um, our um desire to please Allah because I think people convert to Islam for a variety of reasons and and you know without regardless of what a person's intentions are um for a lot of new Muslims there is a a zealousness just wanting to please Allah as much as possible and wanting to be the perfect Muslim and unfortunately subhanallah because we live in the 21st century and our example of the perfect muslim rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's no longer with us in front of us for us to model ourselves on so we only have other muslims to model ourselves on Mm -hmm. and so it can become very confusing for the new muslim about if if they're not familiar with the seerah what exactly makes a good muslim and so many muslims these days conflate culture and religion and i'm not slating culture culture is an inherent part of being a human being but we need to know where culture ends and islam begins and vice versa yeah so i think it's it's a very important thing that i a lot of new muslims and i see this with sisters who i mentor they will try to adopt a cultural norm that comes from a country that has a majority muslim population yeah because they assume Mm -hmm. that that is islamic yes yeah. But what is to say and who is to say that British or Welsh or English or Scottish or Irish cultural norms aren't equally valid as long as they're not contradicting Islamic values? Mm-hmm. You know, why why should we have to give them up? And I think that this is this has taken me years to come to terms with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll be honest. And I think, too, because I, you know, I've lived in various countries. I've lived in obviously I grew up in Canada, left there when I was 18, went to Japan, I've lived in Kuwait, I've spent time, uh, well, I spent a very short time in Qatar, a very short time years ago in Syria. Um, So, you know, I've lived in different cultures for different amounts of time, and then in the UK. So for me, I think, especially living in Japan, it sort of killed any sort of ethnocentrism I might have, thinking that my culture is the right culture. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, but that's given me, that's given me this insight that, you know, okay, I can be British Mm -hmm. and be Muslim, you know, and, and quite passionately so, and the two are not in contradiction with each other. Absolutely. But I did spend a large chunk of time trying to become essentially Arab culturally yes. because those were the people I was with and yeah. that was presented to me as this is Islamic identity mm-hmm. you know did you have something like that as well pushed on you was it pushed on me I think no I wouldn't say yes I went through that phase 
Mm. I went through that phase and I went through that stage, whatever you want to call it, but I don't think it was pushed on me. I actually think it was more of, a, again, a rebellious thing I did um, because, I'm, again, I'm not going to mention any kind of um, labels in here, yeah. but, um, you know, put it like this, you know, there was one kind of way of, put, let's backtrack a bit. I didn't know what a school of thought was, right, when I took my Shahada. My, my... Neither did I. Right. I just thought, I was like, what's a Hanafi? What's a, what's a, you know, a, a yeah. Hanbali? Uh, what the heck? You know, what are these things? You know, I just thought we were all Muslim. No, clearly not. And obviously as time's <laughs> gone on, there are, <laughs> yeah, there are more denominations and, and, and fractions and, and goodness knows what, right? Yeah. But there was one way of thinking, shall we say, which was very much pushed on me, but that never sat right with me to begin with. And mm. I rebelled from that. So I went, mm -hmm. I was very kind of conservative shall we say okay and you know and I and I you know I wouldn't clap because it wasn't from the sunna or I wouldn't you know and I and I ended up going from wearing modest clothing mm -hmm. uh you know for example I was wearing the headscarf before I took my shahada and that that's a yeah. whole nother topic of conversation but Not I was sure. dressed very modestly and then I went from that to being completely covered up like literally head to toe black gloves niqab kimar wow fire, subhanallah everything walking the streets of london town the central london as well and then that's how i was for a very long period of time and if that's you that's fine if yep. you think that's you know that that's great but fast forward 15 years i am not that person anymore no um <laughs> no and amanda can definitely vouch for that um you know I've, you know, I've, I think I've had a very similar journey. I've had a very yeah. similar thing where, you know, wanting to do everything by the book and so taking everything very literally. Yes, I don't think I did it, though, in rebellion to what I was being taught. Mm. I think it, indeed it was just the opposite. I just wanted to be the best I could be. And I figured that as long as I followed every single rule, that would make me better. Yes, yes. But where did I take the rules from? Well, that's a whole other yes. story exactly and actually no I do agree and there was a part of me who which did want to you know do everything by the book so to speak but mm -hmm. because the thing is similarly I think maybe maybe she's stuff I don't know I, I got married pretty quickly okay. um and he was even though his ethnicity usually are from a particular school of thought mm -hmm. he was very much against it like okay. very much the opposite and I think coupled with my overzealous kind of attitude as you are when you're very young 20 21 you know, and then you meet someone who was also young at the time anyway, um, who has those similar kind of ideologies, I suppose you could say, you kind of go with it, don't you? And then you kind of, it's going to be such a silly quote, what I'm going to say, but you kind of take it as gospel. Um, and, and you kind of go with it. And then it, it's yeah. just like, well, hold on a minute, you know, again, where am I taking this information from as well? But you know, we shouldn't just, I suppose the topic of blind following can come up another time. But you know, mm -hmm. I don't believe in taking everything as face value, just because all oh, so and so is telling me. Um, and I think as well, the reason why I've also come away from that kind of ideology or way of thinking is because of my life experiences since then. You know, don't get me wrong, I do lean towards a particular school of thought. I, mm -hmm. I really do lean toward it, but I'm much more open-minded than what I was before. And um, mm -hmm. my viewpoint is very holistic, I suppose you could say, um, and much more varied now. Um, subhanallah you know and I think going back to what you said about customs and culture and stuff like that you know I think one of the reasons why for me personally that I moved mm. from London after growing up there since I was six years old wasn't just because I was fed up with it being overcrowded but mm. <laughs> but no although I that's got to be a factor oh on. it's a mahoosive factor oh my goodness <laughs> I mean I have to go to London for work every now and again well not now alhamdulillah yeah. you know because we're all sort of locked in the borders are shut oh. but surely coming to South Wales that was part of it oh absolutely I mean going back to my route um I'm, I'm actually yeah. what was discussing before finding out who I really was because I think with my experiences as well I actually ended up not realizing who I was anymore which mm -hmm. happened with abuse anyway right mm -hmm. but True. I'm like who, who's Aisha you know who is she am I am I Arab no am I South Asian no who am I and yeah. I've got this I do have a culture you know we, but we have our own language and we have you know I don't see why I can't be British as you said earlier on and Muslim at the same time the two do go hand in hand together as do other cultures in the world you know Islam you know let, let's take this let's, let's be real that mm -hmm. most Muslims in the world are in Indonesia we're not even in South Asia or the Middle mm -hmm. East mm -hmm. you know so come on people you know we, we need to be comfortable with who we are as long as like you said it doesn't contradict 
exactly. um, rulings or Sharia or whatever. Or, and then Alhamdulillah, there's nothing wrong with that. And to say there is, is, is wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think, to be honest, I mean, I've been Muslim, well, I converted officially in 1998, but I've been practicing for about a year before that. So that's what, 23, 24 years. And I've seen the community as a whole shift in that time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I remember when I first converted, I was at university. So obviously yeah. that's, that's a slightly different setting as well. And I was at a university which has um, it had an Arabic and Islamic studies degree program. So there were a lot of Muslims in that campus. Um, and the ISOC was very active and so on. But it was also very politically active. And it, it still is that, you know, it's, it's quite famous yeah. for its political activism as well. And I remember um, being surrounded by sort of every type of Muslim you could think of. Mm -hmm. You know, again, without using labels, but think of yeah. any label, there was a contingent at that university. And so really quickly, I was being told by one set of sisters that I had to find a teacher and I had to pick a school of thought for consistency yeah. and I yeah. had to follow that teacher no matter what. Mm -hmm. And then I had another group of sisters telling me that, you know, um, forget about these schools of thought and just go back to the pure sunnah. Yeah. which of course they couldn't answer where that information came from. But anyway, and then I had another group of sisters telling me that, you know, Islam is simple, just practice your five pillars. But what we need to do is, is establish the Khilafah. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, every and everything in between. So yeah. I quite quickly and Alhamdulillah, I was probably a few years older than a lot of these sisters at university because mm -hmm. I was postgraduate and I had taken a few years out between my undergraduate and my postgraduate. So I was already like 26, 27. And I was looking at these very young, we're talking 18, 19 year olds mm -hmm. and thinking to myself, you have had no life experience. Yes. You are talking about Islam and you're, 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 you're in a bubble of mm -hmm. education, which is wonderful. And I loved it. And I did enjoy being in that bubble of education. But I remember thinking to myself, the way you are approaching your faith is not going to set you up for life in the real world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I actually am thankful for that because I was able to see beyond what they were trying to push on me. Yeah. Um, and sort of, I did sort of reject basically all of their ways of, of, of you know, recommending how I, how I learn my religion. And I sort of, picked my own way of doing it as it were mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um for better or for worse you know but uh, yeah. you know I found a mosque near where I was living which wasn't near the university at all I started taking classes there and so on but definitely the the thing about the labels you know sort of straight away I was plunged into this world of labels mm. and people asking me are you this or are you that and I'd be like I don't yes. really know what that means yeah. but definitely but so that was what I started with Whereas nowadays, I think because we are, well, it's been a whole other generation now has now grown up and is a university. Mm -hmm. And not just that, I think living where I live, the Muslim community here is very, very old and established. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there isn't a big group of sort of recent arrivals from other countries. Although, mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who have just come from places like Syria or from Pakistan or from Iraq or wherever, but there are also equally people who have been here for four, five, six generations and more. Yeah. And those people who's, who are now, you know, it's their great, great, great grandparents who came to the UK are finally, I, I can see, reaching that balance of being comfortable in their Muslim identity. Mm -hmm. And they are practicing and they are praying and fasting and doing everything that they need to do. But they are very, very British and very, yes. very Welsh. And yeah. I think that as more time goes on, the UK Muslim community will become more established in that sense. Mm. You know, I mean, if, if you think about it, I mean, growing up in Canada, as I did, we have, you know, third and fourth and fifth generation people from all over the world who don't speak a word of, of their ancestral language anymore. They just speak English or they just speak French, you know, and we're seeing that now with the Muslim population in the UK, mm. you know, generations of kids who don't speak Arabic or Urdu or Bengali anymore. Mm -hmm. you know and people lament this as being a bad thing and sure yeah. it, it's always good to speak another language definitely but there is an identity shift and I think as long as we can find that 
that factor that you know that people feel that they can still be muslim while being british i think yeah. that that's you know a super important thing to see and i am seeing it happen alhamdulillah yeah i mean i've only been back home in wales for what three and a half months or three months or so now mm -hmm. and i i think i agree to that i mean it's not been a long time i've been here but for what i've seen a little i have seen i actually do think that's very true of what you said when i was in london i, I can't say i felt the same from the muslim community um mm -hmm. I, I felt i felt they were very much Muslim first, which is fine, and then British, or maybe they're South Asian or Arab or whatever culture first, before being British. It was almost like it was a bad thing, um, or, you know, a very negative, it had negative connotations. If you being British. That. Yes. You know what I think this is? And, you know, for fear of painting our podcast as being a Welsh podcast, it is oh, not. Yes. You know, we're online. This is for everybody. We just happen to both live in the same place. Yeah. But, um, subhanAllah, but I think that definitely that is a Wales v England thing, you know, because there is a connotation and it's a weird one that English seems to be not just a national identity, but an ethnic identity, whereas Welsh, we don't have that. I think the other day I was watching a TV program, actually, which was called, it was something about being black and Welsh, and it was part of Black History Month. Uh -huh. And it was interviewing people from Wales who come from African or Afro-Caribbean backgrounds. Yeah. And I, some of them are Welsh speakers, first language Welsh speakers. Wow, some amazing. of them were, you know, mixed race or otherwise, but, but, you know, they were all very, very Welsh. And I'm saying this as somebody who hasn't grown up in Wales, who is living here, living here for like the past 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. These people were very Welsh, mm -hmm. mashallah. And, and, and I say that as a good thing. So there isn't this idea of Welsh as being an ethnic name. Whereas definitely English comes across as, to me, common use, English means white. Yeah. I Whereas Welsh doesn't necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has allowed the Muslim community in Wales to feel that they are Welsh mm -hmm. more than perhaps Muslims in London feel that they are English. And then British is just, well, British is just what your passport is, isn't it? I mean, it's not really like, yeah. is it a culture? Is it, it's a, it's a, such a diverse little set of islands, really. To me, it's just my nationality, but. Yeah. Yeah, but I, it, this is, you know, it's really interesting, but I think that this is something that as, you know, converts, I know a lot of converts, and this isn't to say that all converts who live in the UK are British. I mean, in, in our uh, study circle we have a lot of converts who are from eastern europe mm -hmm. yeah. you know so again that's a that's another um set of challenges that they will face because obviously they are converts and also immigrants and dealing with the prejudice that immigrants face in the uk one of my friends is actually mauritian uh she's a convert to islam she's mauritian um, really wow yeah yeah she's in london but um she's mauritian and i have a, another friend i think she's from guyana if I've said that wrong, and if the sister's listening, please forgive me. Terrible. Um, and then we've got, you know, we've also got um, converts who are they um, an Asian, as in, you know. East like, Asian, you mean? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, we find that too. So this is another thing that I want yeah. to raise awareness about through the podcast is that mm -hmm. when we talk about converts, I mean, people some of my really close friends when I mentioned a convert sister and then I mentioned that she was Jamaican they were like oh I didn't know there weren't any there were there were converts who aren't white and we have this you know I think that there is sort of this idea that when you see a white person in hijab a white woman in hijab or a white man with a beard wearing a thobe you think oh mashallah look at the convert hmm. and the thing is there are I would think there are more white Muslims who are not converts than there are white Muslim converts because I'm including in white people from Albania, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people yeah. from a lot of North African people, mm -hmm. uh, people from Bilad Hashem, people from Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and places like that. A lot of them are very fair skinned, blue eyes, blonde hair. Mm -hmm. um, you have everybody from the Caucasus region, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, huge numbers of Turkish people, even if they're not from the Caucasus region, are very white. Kosovans. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, seriously, I have friends who are from, um, well, they're from Srebrenica, the city. Oh, OK. Yeah. And they've they came to the UK as refugees. Now, if you saw me and them walking down the street, you might yeah. think that we were related. 
Yeah. Right. And yet they are not converts. <laughs> so this is my point is that there are more white people who are Muslim who are not converts to Islam than there are white converts to Islam in the UK specifically. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm, you know, I have no statistics to back this up. But also convert doesn't equal a white person. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I know in our halakha alone, we have people from South Asian backgrounds whose families are Sikh and Hindu. We have people mm -hmm. from African and Afro-Caribbean backgrounds. We have people from China. We have people, I have a lot of Japanese friends who are converts um, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is, this is something as well that I want to spread awareness of that the convert community itself is as diverse as the planet. Yes. And... It's and yet, we do have different challenges because of that. Obviously, living in the UK, anybody who isn't white will have challenges with racism and so on. But we also have a lot of commonalities in our experiences as converts. Mm. You know, so hopefully we'll be able to get some people on who can yeah. you know, share with us their journey and, you know, sort of shed some light on this diversity, just even just within the convert community. So that'll be really, really good. Inshallah. Inshallah, yeah, we will do. So I think what we're going to be doing with this podcast is covering a range of different topics. So today's episode has really just been a chance for us to introduce ourselves to the listeners, to the audience, so that you can get to know Aisha and Amanda a little bit better. But for future episodes, we have a whole range of topics planned, and we will be bringing guests on as well to discuss these topics. Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of put our heads together before we, you know, obviously we planned before we started the podcast, and we've come up with several kind of like headings if you like but underneath that there will be loads of topics within that kind of uh, mm -hmm. bracket yeah. so for example we have islam how to's common struggles family life mental health and social issues so if i just pick a few from each one of those just to explain so these so are like the themes that we're going yeah, to the be themes, bringing your topics it. up under yeah um so for example islam how to's one of the questions i get asked quite a lot is recommended reading for new muslims or those thinking about islam so that was one particular thing we're going to be um discussing we're yeah. obviously going to be talking about convert experiences um common struggles dealing with loneliness post conversion mm -hmm. that's and a big even, one yeah and even the conversion closet how to come out of the conversion closet announcing islam to family friends and colleagues mm. So that should be quite an interesting topic. Then obviously yeah. we've got family life and what's going to be spoken about? Marriage. <laughs> marriage is always a big one, but not just marriage. It's also everything that marriage yeah. entails. So yeah. building a home, raising your kids. Um, yeah, if, you know, Allah forbid those of us who have faced divorce, how to deal with it, how to get on with your life afterwards. Yeah. Um, we have mental health as well. Mm -hmm. For example, we're actually going to talk about counseling or Rukia. Yes, we are going to go there. Um, <laughs> we're going to, exactly. We're going to navigate cultural assumptions about mental health. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we've got social issues, which you, we touched upon a little bit here, you know, racism within the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, and an interesting topic I, I think would be extremely wonderful when we do talk about this are male converts more privileged than female converts and interesting so why? Yeah. um and then obviously you've got dealing with this islamophobia and racism again yeah and starting in prison rehabilitation and life after prison so we're going to touch upon many topics which hopefully will be of interest and it's not um, just us talking about this you yes. know for, for certain topics we will bring in people with expertise in those topics but this podcast is definitely for converts, by converts, um, and we really want to get as many voices on as we can. So if anybody has suggestions, people we could have on, do let us know. I'm on social media. You can always try to DM me on Instagram. My mm -hmm. handle is at Amanda Sensei. Aisha is also online. Yeah. You can probably find her on Facebook if you search hard <laughs> enough. You, you will find me and my Instagram well, handle is where the daffodils grow and I think it's all one word if not there'll be underscores I can't remember but you'll you'll find me yeah Inshallah. yeah we're yeah. all over the place so we're, all over. we're everywhere you won't yeah. be able to shut us up so, so but um, I think for today yeah. we're gonna have to wrap up yeah thank you everyone so much for tuning in I'm Aisha and I am Amanda and you've been listening to Converts Unplugged until next time, assalamu alaikum everyone. Bye. Wa alaikum salam.